On February 10th, the U.S. Patent Office published a patent submitted by Tesla in October of 2021 that relates to Tesla's using LiDAR. What the heck is up with a patent about LiDAR from Tesla, the company that never uses LiDAR? And also, what really is LiDAR and how is it different than cameras and such? Let's take a look. For those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm not gonna go too deep into this patent. Patents are just, they're written in a certain way that <laughs> makes them kind of annoying to read. So I'm just gonna take a very quick look at the summary of the patent. I will obviously leave a link to the patent itself in the description. If you like to read patents, go for it. But you know, it's written the same way, embodiments of blah, 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 and all of this stuff. But the really important part of this is actually not what's in the patent, and I wanna talk about that mostly. But I'm gonna start with the patent just to make sure that everybody has a basic understanding. The title of the patent is Multi-Channel Sensor Simulation for Autonomous Control Systems. And the beginning of the abstract is, an autonomous control system combines sensor data from multiple sensors to simulate sensor data from high capacity sensors. And if we go to the summary page, we can see autonomous control systems combine sensor data from multiple sensors, right? Same thing we already heard. Paragraph five here says, high capacity sensors are sensors that may have improved characteristics over other sensors in terms of, for example, resolution, field of view, or the like. A small number of high capacity sensors may be sufficient to collect a substantial amount of information on the environment. However, high capacity sensors can be costly and complex. In one embodiment, the high capacity sensors include light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, sensors that have a 360 degree field of view for data collection. Continuing on, in contrast, some sensors have smaller capacity than high capacity sensors, that would be cameras by the way, but may be relatively inexpensive, portable, and readily available than high capacity sensors, which would be the LiDAR systems. In one embodiment, the autonomous control system simulates high capacity sensor data of the physical environment from a combination of replacement sensors that may each have a lower capacity than the high capacity sensors. And finally, the autonomous control system allows vehicles that lack expensive and complex high capacity sensors to achieve autonomous guidance even with information from sensors that may have lower capacity than these high capacity sensors. So basically the idea of the patent and something that I've talked about in previous videos, you can check them out up here. Andre Kapathy has talked about this at length, but basically the idea is to take all of the cameras that the Tesla has and to reproduce a pseudo LiDAR image from LiDAR. So this is a really cool patent, but why is Tesla then using LiDAR in order to make this work. So first of all, let's just take a kind of schematic look at how a car detects what's around it. So in this image, we have the blue here is ultrasonic sensors, which detect things that are very, very close. And it works really much like radar and LiDAR and sonar. All of those kinds of things basically work in the same method. They just work differently in the details, but the major aspects are the same. Anyway, so the blue is sonar, it detects close up objects, right? It's good for parking. It's good for detecting this truck that's right next to this thing. Then you have the radar system, which is this orange thing that's looking forward and detecting things directly in front. And then you have a series of cameras that's looking around. And of course you can add LiDAR to this setup as well. Now the difference between cameras, which is these yellow things here and the orange, which is the radar and the blue, which is the sonar and whatever color the LiDAR would be if you had LiDAR, is that cameras are passive. So basically they receive photons from the world, right? <laughs> Just like our eyeballs. Our eyes don't shoot out rays, even though the people in the Renaissance thought that was the case, but they don't. So our eyes don't shoot out rays, they just receive rays from the outside world, like the lights that are shining into my eyes right now and you know me seeing things, whatever. So that's the way cameras work. All of these other systems, LiDAR, sonar, and radar, all are active, so they shoot things out and then they wait and they receive information back about the world around them from that. So we've got passive sensors like cameras and human eyeballs, and we've got active sensors like radar and LIDAR and sonar. So a real quick step here into the world of electromagnetism. We have, you know, all the way from radio waves, which are multiple meters long, so this is 10 to the third, right, it's big, to microwaves that are 10 to the negative second, right, so this is in meters, and so it's like shrinking down. So this is on the centimeter scale, microwaves are on the centimeter scale. That happens to be where automobile radar is. Automobile radar is 79 gigahertz, or somewhere around 3.7 millimeters, so somewhere on the centimeter range, a little bit smaller than that. So the wavelength of this light is like, 
you know, about yay big, <laughs> something like that. So still very much visible, right? Then when you move up to LiDAR, I was looking around for this. What I've got is they're at 905 nanometers, which is somewhere in the ultraviolet range. That seems to be the range that works very well for LiDAR. That also puts them at, I believe, around 330 terahertz. So automobile radar is 79 gigahertz. And then if you ratchet up the scale several times, you've got, I think, four orders of magnitude more, 330 terahertz for ultraviolet light, or around 10 to the negative eighth meters, or around 905 nanometers. So somewhere in that range, forgive me if my numbers aren't quite exact, all these powers of 10, sometimes I get lost in how many powers of 10 we've got. But basically, LiDAR uses much, much shorter wavelength light than does a radar system in the car. And by the way, the radar system in the car is, is on the order of, it's, it's a little bit higher frequency, but it's on the order of the frequency of your microwave oven. So that's just a really interesting little trivia fact about that. All right, so no matter what the frequency, what the heck does radar or LIDAR or sonar actually do? Okay, so this is a radar antenna, so it works the same for all of them. It just depends on the wavelength that they're using. And sonar actually uses air as opposed to electromagnetic waves. So anyway, but same, same basic deal. So you've got a radar antenna, You've got an object, you know, an airplane in the sky. This would be a really good use for radar. And the radar shoots out a pulsed beam. So it, it shoots out pulse, 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 pulse like that. And it sends it out. And if you've ever seen those World War II movies where they've got sonar in the submarine and it goes boom, boom, right? So sonar is using the speed of sound in water. Of course, this uses the speed of light, which is much, much, much faster. But basically it sends out a pulse and then it waits for a return at that frequency. So if this was using 79 gigahertz, it would only be looking at 79 gigahertz coming back. Now, I know there's a complication to this, but just ignore this right now. So right now the airplane is sitting still in the sky. So maybe think about a balloon or something like that as opposed to an airplane. So it's sitting still in the sky. The radar dish is sitting still on the earth. And so it shoots out a 79 gigahertz pulse. It gets back a 79 gigahertz pulse some period of time later. And you know, if you add up several of these, then it will go like, oh, there's something in the sky at approximately this place. And how it determines distance is it just waits, right? It sends it out and knows exactly what the speed of light is. It's like around three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So you've got something along those lines. So only a computer is fast enough to count this fast, but basically it starts a clock and it's just going one, two, three, four, five and waiting as the thing goes out and comes back. Then all you do is you take the time, you divide it by the speed, you have that distance because it has to go out and come back and you know how far away the object is. So as this picture shows, it gives you the basic idea of distance. You just wait, divide by two, et cetera, right? You figure this stuff out. You can also determine the speed of something and that is using the Doppler shift. So basically if something is coming towards you, it's going to blue shift the light slightly. So if you shoot out 79 gigahertz, you might actually get back something like 80 gigahertz, which is why you actually need a bandwidth for this. You don't just want an individual 79 gigahertz like individual thing, you need an actual band from like say 75 to 84 gigahertz, something along those lines. I think it's actually smaller than that. But anyway, so you need to have this range and as you shoot it out, if it comes back higher frequency than what you got, you know the thing is heading towards you and you can calculate exactly how fast it's heading towards you. And if it's been reduced, if the gigahertz goes down in this, then you know the thing is heading away from you at that speed. And then if we look at this image, which is like a simulation of how LiDAR looks, you can see that we've got this pulsed thing, right? It pulses out and then it determines how far away everything is. You can also see uh, shadows, right? So this, since this is active, it's basically like a light and it's casting light out. So anything that is casting a shadow here creates a shadow, a LiDAR shadow. So anyway, and that would be true for radar and stuff like that too. And in actual fact, there is not a pulsing anymore, I believe. I believe that LiDAR actually is continuous and what it does is it actually modulates the frequency and it uses that modulation to figure all of these things out. So the pulsing is kind of a simplified thing, but then again, this entire discussion is a little bit simplified. And then as we see in this image, you can actually figure out where things are in space, right? This, there's a lot of engineering involved with this. It's not simple by any means, but you can detect that there's a motorcycle over here in this box. There's a van over here in this box. There's a light pole over here. There's trees, there's curbs. All of that stuff can be detected. And the really, really big advantage of LiDAR is it tells you exactly how far away you are from everything. And of course, LiDAR being in the ultraviolet frequency is really good. It cuts through things like water, snow, fog, dust, a lot of stuff that in the visual range is blocked from us, right? A heavy rainstorm makes it really difficult to see, but the LiDAR can actually cut through that. So it gives you advantages in terms of knowing exactly how far away you are from everything. It gives you advantages just like radar in terms of knowing how close or how fast you're approaching an object in front of you. So that's actually very advantageous as well. 
and with some engineering, you can figure out what objects are around you as well. So you might think like, well, this is a great thing. Why would we not want to use LiDAR? Well, number one, they're expensive. Number two, they're fragile. But both of those things can be compensated for through engineering. The big issue with LiDAR in, in the overall scheme of things is a sensor fusion issue. And what that means is when you have multimodal data, so you've got LiDAR and you've got visual and you've got radar and you've got sonar, when you've got these things, all four of these things have to agree in order to make a decision. And what happens when two of these input sources don't agree? At that point, you have problems and you have to have like some sort of voting system or something like that. And you're wasting a whole bunch of processor cycles going like, what's actually happening right now? What's going on in the world? You know, am I seeing a car directly in front of me? Am I approaching it really rapidly? This is a big problem with radar, because if you use this picture as a way of looking at this, your car, let's say it's going like 50 kilometers an hour through this intersection or something. That means that all of the stuff in front of it that's not moving has a relative velocity of negative 50 kilometers an hour. That means that every object in front of you, every piece of road, every piece of tree, all these buildings, even this car, if it's sitting still, has a relative velocity of 50 kilometers an hour coming towards you. And everything behind you has a relative velocity of a negative 100 kilometers an hour going away from you. So it's very difficult, as James Dalma and I talked about, and you can watch this video, it's a really good video. But what happens is LIDAR, radar, all of these things put the world world into buckets. And so there's a bucket of 50 kilometers an hour com coming towards you, and there's a lot of stuff in that bucket. So if you happen to have a piece of construction equipment or something big like that that's laying flat across the road, it can actually get lost in the noise in the 50 kilometer an hour coming towards you bucket. And that can cause the car to completely miss that in terms of LIDAR or radar or any of those types of sensors. And then you've got the visual sensor, which is going like, hey, I think there's something in the road. And the LIDAR or radar sensor is going like, nah, I don't think so because it's all in this bucket and it's just noise. And so there's this confliction that can happen, which can either delay braking or it can actually, in a really bad case, cause an accident. So that is the big negative. The engineering aspects of expense and durability of LiDAR, you know, that's going to get solved over time. So LiDAR is going to become cheaper and, and more capable over time and more robust. But the big issue is the sensor fusion issue. So here you can see a Tesla, right? It's just got three cameras in the front, four on the sides, and one in the back. And of course, it's got ultrasonic sensors for doing close-up work when you're parking and things like that. But okay, so that's the disadvantage of LiDAR, but how do you compensate? Because the big thing about cameras are, as you know, is that the world is kind of a two-dimensional thing to you, right? And yet, we human beings have a way of approximately determining distances. So I can look at the camera that I'm staring at right now, and I can guess that it's around a half a meter away from me, you know, probably I can reach out my hand anyway. So, you know, I can I can guess that because I've got two eyes and I can I can triangulate the distance to the camera lens. So that's exactly what's going on here. We've got not just two, but we actually have, and I'll show this picture, you know, you've got a whole bunch of images that you can stitch together. And again, I've done videos on this, check out the playlist if you're interested in that. But basically you can stitch all this together. But the problem is you have to have some sort of ground truth to match that up to in order to train a neural network. So again, as I've talked about in a lot of videos, neural networks require a ton of data and that data has to be labeled and it has to have a ground truth. In other words, you need to know just take two cameras, you know, just take the front two cameras or something like this in this car, and there's an object up here. And so the cameras can, at the beginning, the neural networks and the cameras can say like, oh, I think that's a thousand meters away or something, right? Obviously that's incorrect. But what you can do is you can use real world LIDAR. So you can actually run a LIDAR unit on a test car and it can actually get you a ground truth exact distance to some object in front of you. Maybe it's like five meters ahead, right? So the, the camera neural network makes a massive mistake and then the training goes like, nope, that was wrong. So let's try again. And then it gets closer and closer and closer. So what it's using is the LIDAR as a method of getting ground truth about actual distances and speed, relative velocities between all of these things, which then allows the camera systems to train. And so now if we look back at the patent, you can see what's going on here, right? We've got an autonomous control system combined sensor data from multiple sensors. That would be the cameras around the car that get stitched together to simulate sensor data from high capacity sensors, which would be the LIDAR thing. So basically they're using the LIDAR systems in their test cars to get an initial approximation of how far away things things are and get the neural networks that are based only on cameras, which are low capacity sensors as they call them here, to simulate 
effectively the data from a high capacity, expensive and difficult to utilize sensor. And so the goal here, as you see in this picture, is to stitch together a bunch of different camera images so that they all match up together. And in the front is probably the most important part, although the side is also important. But basically you can see how multiple cameras here are creating this image and the multiple cameras also, you know, this is stitched together into one 2D image, but you have differentiation, right? The cameras are separated physically in space so they can triangulate the distance to things by the offset between them. So that is exactly what you're trying to do. It's a very, very nasty, complicated engineering problem. But the basic idea is that if you have enough data from a LiDAR based system that says this is exactly how far away this Mazda, whatever it is, CX-9, I believe, <laughs> whatever the Mazda is in front, right? So if we know from a LiDAR system that that Mazda is five meters in front of you, then we can actually train all of these cameras to say like, oh, with this offset and this kind of thing, that means that this object is five meters in front of me. And it's at a relative speed of like 10 kilometers an hour as I'm slowing down to this light, right? So you can train up a neural network to do this. And once you train the neural network adequately enough, you can toss out the LiDAR entirely. You don't need it anymore. And that of course is the beauty of this patent and the beauty of the system that Tesla is working on. They're using LiDAR as like a stepping stone to get them to the point where they don't need LiDAR anymore. And the proof is in the pudding. I'm driving FSD beta 10.10.2 right now. It doesn't have radar. It doesn't use radar. I have radar in my car, but it doesn't use the radar and it doesn't really use the ultrasonic stuff for anything in terms of driving, except making sure that it stays away from cars next to it on the road. But it's only using vision and that vision is able to create a pseudo LiDAR interpretation of the world live. So it's able to say how far away things are, what speeds they're traveling at, relatively speaking. It's not quite as accurate as LiDAR or radar, but we're talking about maybe being off by a couple of centimeters or something like that. And in the world of driving, a couple centimeters is fine, right? You never, you never wanna get that close to another car anyway. So it's fine for it to not be quite as precise as long as it's almost as precise, it's completely fine. And then of course, the big, 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 huge advantage to this is once you've got pseudo LiDAR going, you can get rid of LiDAR and radar and you only have one source of data input. You don't have to worry about sensor fusion. And that is the gigantic takeaway. It really doesn't even have to do with the expense of LiDAR or the fact that it could be fragile. It more has to do with the fact that you don't want sensor fusion. Sensor fusion issues are really, really problematic. You don't want to have that issue where one sensor is telling you something's there and another one is not, and you're having to figure out which one is right. You want to rely on one sensor that's going to give you accurate data all the time and not have to take guesses between which of these sensors is correct. So that's the reason why this is really important. And that's the reason why Tesla has this patent and it's just really incredible. Again, kudos to this entire team that worked on this because this is really, really, really difficult to take all of these cameras that are disparate in space and stitch them together into one thing and then be able to triangulate things. It's a gigantic step. It's a huge patent. It's really important for Tesla and it allows them to be able to create this pseudo LiDAR and not have to use LiDAR in their cars. All right, I hope you found this episode fun and informative. Yeah, it got into the weeds a little bit, but hey, you know, that's exactly what this channel is all about. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. And of course, if you wanna join the team, definitely check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.